Okay. John Ashbury. Thank you. I, I can't see anybody, but I, I can hear you. So I'll read a few poems from my most recent book, which is called Your Name Here. Memories of Imperialism. Dewey took Manila and soon after invented the decimal system that keeps <laughs> libraries from collapsing even unto this day. A lot of mothers immediately started naming their male offspring Dewey, which made him queasy. He was already having second thoughts about imperialism. In his dreams, he saw library books with milky numbers on their spines floating in Manila Bay. Soon, even words like vanilla or mantilla would cause him to vomit. One thing that uh, was true of the New York poets from the start is that uh, their poetry is like an extension of, of talk or conversation. It, uh, it sounds like the language English as we speak it, rather than a more literary tongue. Uh, that's one crucial element. Another crucial element is that I, I think the New York School poets had a an, an, uh, generally affirming attitude or affirmative position uh, relative to the world. That is, they, uh, they favored a certain kind of comic spirit that uh, uh, led to poetry that was very funny often, so that humor could be uh, a serious aspect of poetry. <laughs> the sight of a manila envelope precipitated him into his study, where all day with the blinds drawn he would press fingers against temples, muttering, what have I done, <laughs> all the while. Then gradually he began feeling a bit better. The world hadn't ended. He'd go for walks in his old neighborhood, marveling at the changes there or at the lack of them. If one is to go down in history, it is better to do so for two things rather than one, he would stammer, none too meaningfully. <laughs> one day his wife took him aside in her boudoir, pulling the black lace mantilla from her head and across her bare breasts until his head was entangled in it. Honey, what am I supposed to say? Say nothing, you big boob. Just be glad you got away with it and are famous. <laughs> Uh, well, the use of, uh, of, of cliché is very important in my poetry. As I've said many times, I feel that there's something almost sacred about clichés because so many people have used them to express important things that were important to them. And uh, the, that one shouldn't really uh, make fun of them. Although, I guess I do. <laughs> Speaking of boobs, now you're getting the idea. Go file those books on those shelves over there. Come back only when you're finished. To this day, school children wonder about his latter career as a happy pedant, always nice with children, thoughtful toward their parents. He wore a gray ceramic suit, walking his dog, a bulldog, he would point out. People would peer at him from behind shutters, watchfully, hoping no new calamities would break out, or indeed that nothing more would happen ever, that history had ended, yet it hadn't, as the Admiral himself would have been the first to acknowledge. Tell us the story about the New York School of Poets from, 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 from the beginning. Okay. The New York School of Poets actually uh, began not in New York City, but in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the seat of Harvard University, where three of the four poets, uh, John Ashbery, Kenneth Koch, and Frank O'Hara, were all students right after the uh, Second World War. And uh, they met there, and uh, they 
met again in New York City. It's not that I don't like it, but I don't think it's particularly accurate to call as a school. Uh, the word was applied not by us, but by actually a publisher who published our first uh, small pamphlets of poems. He was an art dealer and thought that the, since the New York School of Painters was very big at that time, that some of this prestige would rub off on us. Ashbery's uh, work is of you know fundamental significance to me as a poet, and I've gone to many many readings of his and had many uh, you know chances to talk to him. As a reader, the impact for me of Three Palms was very very strong in the mid seventies. Uh, the idea of that sermonic, I mean, I take that as a work of poetics, doing prose in that way, the incorporation of so many things, the drift. Ashbery moved more and more into a uh, endless open discursiveness. If you go from line A to line B, you, you almost feel a seamlessness, and from B to C, but if you wonder how you got from A to C, there's no connection. So you have that disjunct quality, but it's, it's melted, so it's almost just you float through it like a trance. Then he picks this up from Eliot, I think, especially um, in The Wasteland, and it has a lot to do with the kind of sensibility or trance or hypnosis that, uh, that he's, uh, he's interested in. Something that inspired me, and I think my friends too, about Eliot and Pound, was the bringing in of so many disparate styles and disparate materials. And um, I think that what John and Frank and I did was to take this stylistic variety, which, which has a cultural and historical meaning in Pound and Eliot, and just use it for its own sake, for the, for the fun of it, but also just for the, for the truth of it, that there, there is no style, there's no one style that is the main way in which one has to talk. And if, if, like, if the language of the Renaissance is in one's head, if the French language is in one's head, if the language of the early 19th century is in one's head, why not have that on the page too? Because it, it adds a lot of meaning to change tones and change. So that I think our poetry paid more attention to the surface of the language than what other poets were writing at the time. The New York poets were very eager to find new forms uh, so that in a way they would be reconciling their individual talents with literary tradition, to use T.S. Eliot's categories. Uh, they wrote prose poems, which was considered a very radical and rebellious thing to do. And that showed a receptivity to the French literary tradition. I don't think one has to eat croissant in order to uh, understand French poetry. And also, um, just as uh, in America, um, the, the real ideas at a certain point, except for Stevens and William Carlos Williams, and Pound, of course, earlier, came from that total absorption in an international milieu. Um, it's impossible to uh, be a modern person and have any idea of what your life is like unless you know French poetry. We had certain things in common, uh, particularly uh, a interest in playing with words and with uh, interest in uh, French and surrealism and European modernism and uh, Gertrude Stein and a few other things that weren't really uh, considered uh, respectable at that time long ago when we were young writers. And uh, the uh, we, we sort of went different ways. Frank O'Hara uh, was actually a poet who, whose poetry is a great deal about New York. I mean, he was obviously in love with the city. Uh, I like New York too, but I don't really write about it. I, uh, uh, to me, it's a sort of uh, uh, nice, vacant place to write poetry in, <laughs> although you might not think it was vacant to look at it. Well, the next poem uh, is uh, one of a series uh, of poems that I wrote uh, at work on my lunch hour, which uh, City Lights is going to publish uh, next year under the title Lunch Poems, because Ferlinghetti thought it was so amusing that anyone was sitting around typing during their lunch hour. 
It is 12.10 in New York, and I am wondering if I will finish this in time to meet Norman for lunch. Ah, lunch. I think I am going crazy. What with my terrible hangover and the weekend coming up at excitement-prone Kenneth Coke. I wish I was staying in town and working on my poem at Jones Studio for a new book by Grove Press, which they will probably not print. But it is good to be several floors up in the dead of night, wondering whether you are any good or not. And the only decision you can make is that you did it. I'm going to read a few passages from poems about poetry, about politics, and about my own past life. The first is a uh, one stanza from a long poem called Fresh Air, which I wrote in the 1950s, which is an attack on the academic poetry of the time. This is part four. Supposing that one walks out into the air on a fresh spring day and has the misfortune to encounter an article on modern poetry in New World Writing, or has the misfortune to see some examples of some of the poetry written by the men with their eyes on the myth and the misses and the midterms in the Hudson Review, or if one is abroad, in Bottega Oscura, or indeed in Encounter, what is one to do with the rest of one's day that lies blasted to ruins, all bluely about one? What is one to do? Oh, surely one cannot complain to the president, nor even to the deans of Columbia College, nor to T.S. Eliot, nor to Ezra Pound. And supposing one writes to the Princess Kaitani, your poets are awful, what good would it do? And supposing one goes to the Hudson Review with a package of matches and sets fire to the building, one ends up in prison with trial subscriptions to the partisan Siwani and Kenyan Review. Well, when I went to college at Columbia, Kenneth Koch was one of the professors, and, and a lot of the other students were also very captivated by the poetry, uh, not only of Koch, but of uh, the poets that he unstintingly supported, like Ashbery and O'Hara. And I, I've uh, found uh, reading O'Hara and Schuyler and the others to be tremendously inspiring. When I began writing a poem a day, uh, I knew that uh, in a way, this was very much a New York school project. March 18th is about is set here in Washington Square Park. <laughs> March 18th. When spring comes, I want to sit on a bench in Washington Square Park, remembering when I was a kid, dreaming of being a grown-up who gets to read the paper on a park bench, free of anxiety, duty, responsibility, on a day when the temperature is 57, and Blues for a Dog comes on WBGO, and a friend comes by in a white beard I haven't seen since 1991, when I was about to go to India. He had been there for a year, he said. Would you like to go back, I said. He said he knew ex-cons who'd like to go back to prison for a week-long visit if they could. That's how he felt about India. Kenneth Koch has the greatest comic spirit of the group. He, uh, uh, he was a professor, and uh, he influenced a whole generation of poets by being uh, an extremely effective professor at Columbia University and before that at the New School. Uh, he had great poetry ideas that uh, many people think that uh, in order to write a poem, you have to you know, uh, be inspired as if from a, a lightning bolt. And Koch showed all the ways that you could manufacture your own inspiration by giving yourself a kind of an assignment. It is true that good poetry is difficult to write. Poetry is an escape from anxiety and a source of it as well. On the whole, it seems to me worthwhile. At the end of a poem, one may be tempted to grow too universal, philosophical, and vague, or to bring in history or the sea but one should not do that, if one can possibly help it, since it makes each thing one writes sound like everything else, and poetry and life are not like that. Now I have said enough. Many people, as has often been said, confuse seriousness with solemnity. 
Solemnity is, with solemnity you strike a certain tone and there's no fluctuation, no, hardly any sensitivity possible once you're being solemn. But uh, you can be, you can see the comic aspect of things and be very serious. I went through my teenage years somewhat thinking or somewhat being told that if, if it was to be a truly great poem, it had to be tragic, sad, even depressed. Um, and I reacted against this idea because it, it seemed to me that I was discovering a lot of things. I mean, I'm, I'm glad Eliot was there because it enabled me to feel that my, the happiness I felt was a discovery and that I had something new to say. Perhaps if there had been a really happy T.S. Eliot, I'd written sad poems, but I don't know. We're in front of the White Horse Tavern. Uh, I thought I'd show you this because this is typical of the literary bars that were numerous in the village in the early 1950s. This bar in particular was significant because this is the bar in which Dylan Thomas was drinking on the night he fell into a coma and died a few days later in a nearby hospital. I, I know from this bar in particular, people like Jack Kerouac were kicked out permanently for being uh, too drunk at any one time. The New York School of Poets spent a lot of time in bars like the Cedar Tavern, which is no longer uh, in the same location, and the San Remo Bar, which is not here at all. That's the problem with New York. Things change so much. Now, Frank O'Hara's key to the New York School of Artists was that he was their friend. He became a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and he uh, was a tremendous poet. And in his writing, he would talk about the poets and the artists, and he would introduce the poets to the artists in the bars like the Cedar Bar that was traditionally the artist bar, and the San Remo Bar, which was tradi traditionally the literary bar instead of going to the Upper East Side or the Midtown bars. They chose bars like this, which were the, where the common people would, would drink and spend their time, the working man. Uh, it appealed to the writers because it was inexpensive. They could hang out all night, have a few beers, uh, enjoy company with their friends, and it was close to where they all lived. We showed each other our poems all the time. Uh, when we were in the Cedar Bar, usually the inside pockets of our coats would have a, a, a poem in it. And um, we would read them and say what we liked and be inspired by each other and so on. Uh, it was very nice because the, um, I, I, I think that for me, as a poet, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me to, to know three people whose poetry was so good that it made me very nervous and um, made me envious, but also emulous, like I wanted I wanted to write as well as they did, of course, in a different way. And we were also all pretty excited by the painters and the, the painting scene. The great thing about a painting is there's nothing there, and then suddenly there's something there. It smells good. It's in a studio filled with sunlight. It's, um, and then also, painters worked all day, so they got exercise, and they were... Um, often in a good mood at night, and sometimes they would even sell a painting and could have a party. So the painters provided the social life for the New York School. Chiefly, I believe it was about 1949, I was uh, living in a kind of very sketchy house on Third Avenue, and I had a room in this house, and Kenneth Koch was one of the other tenants, and we used to sort of sit up late at night chatting, and uh, we had a lot of funny conversations, and I was painting, and he was writing, and but he always had this fantastic sense of humor, which goes to extravagant length, and at that time, he used to wear a... Um, a rubber gorilla mask and sit by the window as the uh, trains passed by <laughs> and waved to the people on the train. And uh, anyway, so that's how I met him. And then one day he said, well, he used to talk about his friend John Ashbery from Harvard, who was, you know, a very special friend and who was a terrific poet. And he was going to be coming to stay in Kenneth's 
apartment and would I please, uh, Kenneth was going to be away and he said, would I please let him in? And he gave me his keys. And then John appeared and uh, he, he was very shy and looked very young and uh, poetic actually. And then in 1950, John had this friend from Harvard, uh, Frank O'Hara, whom he was very uh, devoted to and, and uh, he came to town and he ca by that time I was living somewhere else and he came to my studio and we immediately became friends and in fact he I think was the first person who ever bought a painting of mine which was actually a rather lousy painting and but the price was very low too so <laughs> I met them all around the same time, about between 1949 and 1953. And uh, we met at parties, we met at openings, we met at different people's houses, we met at bars. We all worked on and off together in different kind of projects. Uh, 1957, I started to make it, and I finished it about 1960, uh, a compilation of works uh, that I called the, uh, the Hasty Papers. It was printed on newsprint. It was the size of a tabloid newspaper. I printed 5,000 copies of them. So my idea was to produce this and to draw in everything from as many sources as I could find and writing to all the people whose voices attracted me and thought, well, I can ask T.S. Eliot and I can ask Ezra Pound and I can ask Fidel Castro and I could ask all of these people and why shouldn't they answer me? All they can do is say no. To the film industry in crisis, not you lean quarterlies and swarthy periodicals with your studious incursions toward the pomposity of ants, nor you experimental theater in which emotive fruition is wedding poetic insight perpetually, nor you promenading grand opera, obvious as an ear, though you are close to my heart, but you motion picture industry, it's you I love. Actually, see, a lot of people, I think, thought of the Hasty Papers initially as um, uh, as an edited journal of some kind. I and mean, when the, all of the things are brought together, it does present sort of a time capsule. It really shows you what the moment was, who the people were, and brings in a lot of things from the culture, of, but the world culture and the local, the local culture of what was happening here in New York. But also, what I had done is I had absorbed and assimilated and brought all of these things together so that they became a particular, uh, particular kind of work which was singular in the way that it reflected on ideas of interdisciplinarity, the idea of working in many areas at the same time. Well, the most important thing about uh, the affinities, I guess, was a certain directness, a lack of pretension, a kind of un, uh, unacademic and spontaneous uh, uh, sort of anti-pomposity. <laughs> and I did sort of whatever pleased me. And it was very often against, I mean, at that time, abstract expressionism was the dominant mode. But actually, I, although I did some abstract painting, I, I also use figurative motifs, and that was sort of against the grain at that time. I did the drawings for this very early book, I think it was one of the first pamphlets of poetry by John Ashbery, which was put out by the Tibor Danaji Gallery, which was the gallery that I was affiliated with. And the, that, that, they played an important role in sort of starting the New York School on its way as a school. In fact, the, uh, the proprietor of the gallery, John Myers, who was a great 
a poetry lover, published these, their early works. And in fact, the gallery still exists today, and they have shows that are connected to poetry very often. At the bars, they were, they were drinking, they were uh, fighting, they were having love affairs, uh, they, they were talking poetry and talking art and the intermingling of writing and art. They, they saw that there was a link between the artistic world of the 1950s and the world of words and poetry. And through that, I think that the idea was born of including words and handwriting itself in, into works of art. <laughs> From the point of view of the poets, I got the impression later, I don't know, it's just memory, it may be bad, that the painters <laughs> were the only people who were, who were interested in their work. But because of the nature of art at that time and always trying for like interesting and the avant-garde and you know, all that, uh, they uh, felt as if the painters felt some obligation to be, uh, have an interest in poetry. And I think that Frank, was friendly with the painters. So, well, like anything else, they want to know, what, well, what do you do? And then he would walk around with his poetry in his pocket all the time. He pulled out, you know, oh, I just happen to have my poems with me, you see. played with bands and all that, and I did make a living. I mean, I come from a family where you're supposed to be thinking about making a living. I was a musician in the sense that it was sort of something that happened to me, but I, I wasn't that serious about using it for the rest of my life. By the time I met John, I was already pretty much a painter. I mean, that's what I wanted. I think I met him through Nell Blaine, was uh, a, uh, a painter from Virginia, I believe. She lived on 21st Street, and she was the first woman, she was the first person I knew ever lived in a commercial building. You know, uh, she had a loft, and I, he got invited. I don't know why it's all cloudy out there. What? I don't know why it's all cloudy out there. It might be kind of soapy, I don't it's know. It's dirty. All right. No, kidding. <laughs> I did things with Kenneth. I would make an image and he would write something down and things like that. Uh, if I didn't particularly like what he wrote, I would either <laughs> try to cover it with paint or I would do something in some way that fought against it or presented a more uh, personal view of my own. Sometimes he was so abstract and like so interested in something about the use of language as a something like abstract painting that I I would do things for him because he was my friend and I would try, but I, I didn't approve all the time. I didn't. And uh, you probably not like that I'm saying that I didn't approve, but I didn't. <laughs> What should I play, Jenny? What a difference the day makes. <laughs> The next one is called Liebeslied, which is one of my few attempts to ever write a popular song, which goes, I came to you from out of the blue. What did we do? I ate you up. You saw me there standing alone. I was the bone, you were the marrow. And then one day we walked through a field. I didn't think you would yield, but you did. Ugh. 
And later that day we swam in the rain. You were causing me pain. You couldn't swim. I came to you wearing one shoe. What could I do? The other one was on my prick. That's 1962. I think that the real heart and soul of the New York School of Poets is their, their friendship. Their, the friendship came first, and they're an extremely loyal group of people, loyal to one another, uh, the people in these circles. And probably the person at the center of it was Frank O'Hara, whose personality made him uh, an electrifying per, uh, character, charismatic, and capable of connecting people who would otherwise be uh, dissimilar and unrelated. And he worked himself up from being a, a, a clerk to being a curator of painting at the Museum of Modern Art and was one of the great champions of modern painting, of uh, such abstract expressionist painters as Jackson Pollock. Uh, he wrote a monograph on Pollock. So O'Hara was uh, sort of the Apollinaire of the New York School. Just as Apollinaire uh, championed Cubism, and promoted the painters of his time, in addition to writing uh, great and very new poems, O'Hara combined those tasks as well. Personism has nothing to do with philosophy. It's all art. It does not have to do with personality or intimacy, far from it. But to give you a vague idea, one of its minimal aspects is to address itself to one person, thus evoking overtones of love without destroying love's life-giving vulgarity and sustaining the poet's feelings toward the poem while preventing love from distracting him into feeling about the person. That's part of personism. It was founded by me after lunch with Leroy Jones on August 27, 1959, a day in which I was in love with someone, not Roy, by the way, a blonde. <laughs> I went back to work and wrote a poem for this person. While I was writing it, I was realizing that if I wanted to, I could use the telephone instead of writing the poem, and so personism was born. <laughs> it's a very exciting movement which will undoubtedly have lots of adherents. It puts the poem squarely between the poet and the person, Lucky Pierre style, and the poem is correspondingly gratified. The poem is at last between two persons instead of two pages. In all modesty, I confess that it may be the death of literature as we know it. <laughs> O'Hara, as, as, a, as a poet, is uh, you know, a, a wonderful, buoyant poet who, who, who uh, both combines that, a sense of immediacy but with this incredible artifice and style. I think a lot of the ways in which I was first reading poetry, O'Hara was interpreted as simply being personal, mentioning his friends, kind of takes away from the enormous uh, artifice of that style of an O'Hara poem. Let's see, two aspirins, a vitamin C tablet, and some baking soda should do the trick. That's practically an Alka-Seltzer. Alan, come out of the bathroom and take it. And also the, the, uh, the, the, the social world that he's mapping in the 50s, the relation to race, the relation to the Cold War, uh, that a lot of you know, recent people thinking about O'Hara have, have written about. Um, does he still like her? That's what I wonder. Does he still like her? Yeah, because of the other guy taking her pants off. Yeah, I don't think I don't know if uh, I don't know if they're. You might think she's a big drag right now. Oh, I mean the thing they're trying to get rid Momentarily. of. Momentarily. No, he might. John, the hero. That was. I don't know that that's important enough though. Well, For me, working with Frank was the easier than working with uh, all of the rest of the people. Frank's attitude, I suppose. The fact that he lived nearby, I mean, it could have been a lot of things, but um, uh, it was essentially his voice, the sense of, uh, of feeling for language. And in Frank, I just felt attached in a certain way. There's a way in which uh, I thought, well, perhaps if I, th in thinking about it now, that he would be the most comfortable with my butchering what it was. Yeah. This is a very peculiar situation because while I'm talking to you, I'm typing and also being filmed for educational TV. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it would be nice to be able to isolate the story of the birth of a nation. But I don't think I can because the birth of a nation is 
connected in a hundred ways to all of the things that I had done in the past. I only can tell you how I started on it for about two weeks, night and day, we just drove around the city to different locations where I brought along the, the rough layouts of the scenes that I had, uh, had written for this at various times, which I just sort of had in a loose leaf folder. And uh, then when I had all of this footage shot and had it edited together, it was at that point that after I showed the film to Frank, I asked him to contribute um, uh, text for a particular segment of it. Oh, why do you always take the power away from people? Hey, they're not the gods. Oh. Sweat and sweat. Mm. <laughs> Disgusting. Stop! Stop it! Don't <laughs> When Frank did things like this, everything flowed and appeared to be effortless. He seemed to just sort of, the things just sort of fell out of him. And that was part of what I guess was attracted to me, the way that he did think, was because he always trusted his intuition. Greenberg called this what the real avant-garde was, the process of making discoveries by making things, things catching you unexpected and teaching you something, rather than prefiguring something beforehand, which he called the avant-gardista, the little avant-garde. The next passage is from a poem called The Pleasures of Peace, which was a sort of a protest poem about the Vietnam War, though it turned out not to be about the war so much as about the pleasures of the peace movement and the joys of peace. And this is the last part of the poem. And the big boats come sailing into the harbor for peace, and the little apes are running around the jungle for peace, and the day, that is the star of day, the sun, is shining for peace. Somewhere a mustachioed student is puzzling over the works of Raymond Roussel for peace, and the Mediterranean peach trees are fast asleep for peace, with their pink arms akimbo, and the blue plums of Switzerland for peace, and the monkeys are climbing for coconuts in peace, the Hawaiian palm, and serpents are writhing for peace, those are snakes, and the Alps, Mount Vesuvius, all the really big important mountains are rising for peace and they're filled with rocks. Surely it won't be long. And Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper is moving across the monastery wall a few micrometers for peace. And Paolo Uccello's red horses are turning a little redder for peace. And the Anglo-Saxon dining hall begins glowing like crazy. And Beowulf, Robert E. Lee, Sir Barbarossa, and Baron Jeep are sleeping on the railways for peace and darting around the harbor and leaping into the sailboats and the sailboats will go on and underneath the sailboats the sea will go on and we will go on and the birds will go on and the snappy words will go on and the tea sky and the sloped marine sky and the hustle of beans will go on and the unserious canoe it will all be going on in connection with you peace and my poem like a cadillac of wampum unredeemed and flying madly, will go exploding through new cities, sweet inflated, planospheres, ingenious hair, a camera smashing badinage, cerebral stands of atmospheres, unequal, dreamed of impeachments, candled piers, fumisteries, emphatic moods, terrestrialisms crackle, love's flat, sun's sweets, oh, peace to you. Oh, I was happy to read that again. I haven't read it for a long time. I thought Kierkegaard 
was in a curious and fascinating way a, uh, a kind of spirit hanging over Ashbery and, and the other poets because uh, Kierkegaard had a, had a very natural kind of uh, irony that was highly, high, highly developed. Uh, I'm very fond of the story he tells in Either Or uh, in which uh, a man goes up to heaven and is told by the gods that he can have any wish. He could have riches, a long life, a beautiful woman, anything he wants, just one wish he must choose. He thinks for a moment and then he says, I wish to have the laugh always on my side. And the, there's a moment of silence and then all the gods laugh. I, I think that is a, an example of a kind of uh, anecdote that I think of in association with the New York poets. Uh, that it's possible to reconcile laughter, which usually signifies happiness, with scorn, outrage, and despair. This whole book, New Addresses, that's my face coming out from all my poems. This is by Larry River, it's a cover. All the poems are apostrophes, that is, they're poems written to ideas, concepts, feelings, general conditions, th things it can't answer. This one is to carelessness. And uh, I'm always talking to the subject of the poem. I'm talking to carelessness, as though it were a person. You led me to sling my rifle over my shoulder when its bayonet was fixed on Leyte in the jungle. It hit a hornet's nest, and I fell down screaming. The hornets attacked me, and Lonnie, the corporal, said, Soldier, get off your ass. Later the same day, I stepped on a booby trap that was badly wired. You had been there, too. Thank you. It didn't explode. It was, I don't mention the glasses, but it's when I fell down in the jungle that I, that I lost the glasses. Although I had had very vivid experiences in the Second World War, because I was an infantryman in combat uh, in 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 the Philippines. Um, until two years ago, I never was able to write about it. And the only way I could even talk about it was to make it seem funny. It wasn't funny at all, <laughs> because it, um, it, it, it exposed me to being killed a lot more than if I could see somebody aiming a gun at me. I'd like to read a poem called The World Trade Center. It's in my book, Valentine Place. The World Trade Center. I never liked the World Trade Center. When it went up, I talked it down, as did many other New Yorkers. The Twin Towers were ugly monoliths that lacked the details, the ornament, the character of the Empire State Building and especially the Chrysler Building, everyone's favorite, with its scalloped top so noble. The World Trade Center was an example of what was wrong with American architecture, and it stayed that way for 25 years until that Friday afternoon in February when the bomb went off and the buildings became a great symbol of America like the Statue of Liberty at the end of Hitchcock's Saboteur. My whole attitude toward the World Trade Center changed overnight. I began to like the way it comes into view as you reach 6th Avenue from any side street, the way the tops of the towers dissolve into white skies in the east when you cross the Hudson into the city across the George Washington Bridge. I read Ashbery and O'Hara's informalism, their distaste, and even detestation, although neither one would use that word, for systematic thinking, for, bum for bombast, for anger, as a response to the rhetoric of the Second World War on both sides, and as a refusal of that kind of public, prophetic, sage-like, uh, prophet-like status of the poet. It's the Second World War, which I think is the crucial frame to understand both the New York School and also the work of the poets of my generation. 
So a guy comes over to me, very, very agitated. It's just a couple of blocks from here. And he says, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Theory. It's a classic question as to you know, how people uh, you know, become poets. And it's funny, a as you get older, um, you're always asked to go back to <laughs> this kind of or originary moment about, about between the time you're 20 and 25. And uh, it's easy to uh, try to invent and reinvent what those things were. So you might say, who knows? I, I tend to think now that, that uh, art often gets created with dissatisfaction with um, what's around. I think my dissatisfaction wasn't so much with the poets uh, who would have been uh, available to me uh, when I started to read, but rather with the, the culture uh, that I was living in, American culture, um, in the middle of the Vietnam War, and also with the kinds of writing and the kinds of narrative and the kinds of journalism, the kinds of TV uh, that were being uh, perpetrated constantly. Johnny Cake Hollow. So quolen swacked und miri flupt, sardoon to flagrant swarm, or germy plate, or garvey swape, ib gibbon durs irk clerp, sheb booty blore de dazzy duel dun frupies gigos gly, shud crylophane jed jimsy's cack, enst erdobel fump glyer. Eb hore blut, ig ori sweep, neb nis, neb at, neb guan, schleb atsum imba utsi burft, alapi merp av ords, ein ainsley swish, ein ainsley sploop, ug hals dep dolster flug, ig ars un nimbit trul be grub, ig ubers quake ag blur g g g. It seems to me there isn't a priority between uh, poetics and poems, that they're constantly in exchange. There isn't a priority between groups and individuals, uh, between conversation and individual thought, that these things are always at issue, and different poets will torque them and raise different issues in respect to them. So it's the whole jargon of authenticity, which had a relationship to the way people were reading O'Hara, which I think was a misreading of O'Hara, uh, or Schuyler. Uh, the idea that what was valuable about it was that it was the subjectivity of those people thinking that unlike the more conventional stuff, these people had really broken through to a kind of more fluid kind of subjectivity. I think that that's true to some degree, but there was also a lot of sampling going on that interested me. And the difference between what's inside and outside interests me, the way in which television controls the phrases that occur in my mind, and not trying to edit those out, but include them in to try to keep the stuff, the commercials, the, the, the stuff you hear on the street, the conversations, and to try to orchestrate those different levels of discourse. That's New York poetry for me. My cup is my cap, and my cap is my cup. When the coffee is hot, it ruins my hat. We clap and we slap, have sup with our pap. But won't someone please get me a drink? So in many ways, I'm interested in taking the everyday, making it somewhat comic or torquing it so that one can appreciate it aesthetically, so that it, 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 it registers as aesthetic, but also as constructed, not as natural, not as given, not as authentic, not as simply emotional. I'm happy to say that I, I see a, a revitalization of the New York School influence in American poetry in general. And I think it's a very healthy influence. And there's a, a, a lot of American poetry today that I think is uh, uh, exceptional. And a lot of it has been influenced by the New York School with its example of wit, and charm, uh, humor, the uh, willingness to be experimental and adventurous. Uh, an interest in the new, an interest in art forms uh, and uh, art disciplines other than poetry, all of that. Why is it so important to name uh, predecessors? I guess it isn't. I guess I'm doing it because I'm talking as someone who's supposed to be a descendant of the New York School. I, I don't know if there's progress. I don't know if there's, um, if there's really learning in, in poetry and in the arts. I had been led to believe by certain of my friends that uh, 
that it was wrong to write anything other than metaphorical poems about animals or um, uh, deep portentous poems about one's family and uh, then I could that I could not actually say anything about um, say broken glass on the street. The important thing about the New York School is that uh, I, I responded immediately and emotionally to uh, what they were saying and it seemed that they were um, they were carrying on what was uh, lively, funny, um, decent, uh, and strange in, in writing. Uh, and, you know, poetry, um, poetry sort of appeals to the 14-year-old in, in, in everybody. And there's a, probably a sense in which um, it's difficult for poetry to get past that. The New York School, I thought, um, did find a way to get past that, probably to about 27 years old. Which is, which is 13 years more. Redeemed area. Do you know where you live? Probably. Abner is getting too old to drive, but won't admit it. The other day, he got in his car to go buy some cough drops of a kind they don't make anymore. And the drugstore has been incorporated into a mall about seven miles away with only about half the stores rented. There are three other malls within a four mile area. All the houses are owned by the same guy who's been renting them out to college students for years, so they are virtually uninhabitable. A smell of vitriol and socks pervades the area, like an open sewer in a souk. There's a kind of polyphonic quality to my work. There are different voices talking to each other. They're, they're never made very specific. Uh, it's just a sort of ongoing conversation that's in my my head. I, I did want to write plays at one point and, and, and actually did write some when I was young. I haven't since then, but I, this dialoguing still goes on and I rather enjoyed the experience of writing dialogue and putting words in other people's mouths rather than thinking of what I myself might say about something. So I think these these characters in my, or these nameless voices in my poetry are actually uh, characters in a, in a sort of play who are talking at each other. And, uh, and also I intervene from time to time too, but it's never, it's never very uh, specific. And uh, it just uh, comes out that way. I don't know whether that's the way one should write, but that's the way I do. <laughs> anyway, the cough drops, a new brand, tasted pretty good, like catnip, or an orange slice that is laying on a girl's behind. That's the electrician calling now. Nobody else would call before 7 a.m. Now we'll have some electricity in the place. I'll start by plugging in the Christmas tree lights. They were what made the whole thing go up in sparks the last time. Next, the light by the dictionary stand so I can look some words up. Then probably the toaster. A nice slice of toast would really hit the spot now. I'm afraid it's all over between us, though. Make nice like you really cared. I'll change my chemise, and we can dance around the room like demented dogs, eager for a handout, or they don't know what. Gradually, everything will return to normal. I promise you that. There'll be things for you to write about in your diary, a fur coat for me, a lavish shoe tree for that other, Make that two slices. I can see you only through a vegetal murk, not unlike coral if it were semi-liquid or a transparent milkshake. I have adjusted the lamp, mornings at seven. The tarnish has fallen from the metallic embroidery. The walls have fallen. The country's pulse is racing. Parents are weeping. The schools have closed. All the fuss has put me in a good mood, oh great sun. You know, have to leave this up to other people to uh, uh, decide about. But uh, my, my poetry is playful, but I think also there's something kind of grim about it at the same time. But that's the way life is.